<clears throat> what I want to do today is to, as I sometimes do on the first day, just to talk briefly about sitting. And we'll even take questions, if anyone has any. <clears throat> All of our sessions, we have quite a mixture of all kinds of people from all kinds of centers, all kinds of backgrounds, but this one's got a little more of that than some. So I want to get things out in the open, questions answered, and so on. Before starting that, I want to <coughs> say that the first day is difficult. I've said it a hundred times, but it's, it's always difficult a hundred times. So. And I can't run around, I'm not your mother, taking care of you, so you have to take care of yourself. If you're in real difficulty, speak to someone. The monitors are the people who sit facing in. Speak to them. If they can't help you, uh, try somebody else. If worst comes to worst, get in dice online. <coughs> I want to reiterate the importance of sitting still. Now, I know some of you are from disciplines where that's not part of it, but from my point of view, it's the most important thing we can do. And when we sit still, then we've cut off our escape, which is the last thing we want, so we tend to wiggle. I mean, the wiggling can be so imperceptible that no one knows about it except us. I have one where I just wiggle my thumbs a little bit, you know, it's great relief to just wiggle your thumbs a little bit, you know, it's just a little, little bit. See, we all have something we do eventually as the day gets tough to try to escape. Uh, it may be outright wiggling, but if we're uh, more sophisticated than that, we have little ways of doing it. Don't do it. Uh, see, it's that ability not to do and then just to be it and be with that, which is what makes you grow as a person. And it's very hard. I know it's hard, but we're not here for a picnic. Well, maybe we are. We'll call it session picnic. I don't think anyone would buy that very much. It's not a, exactly a picnic. I want to talk a little bit today about the sitting process itself. Now somebody said to me the other day, calling on the phone, uh, well, what techniques do you do at your center? See, as far as I'm concerned, we don't do any techniques. Now, for some of you, and for any of you that want to try it, if you want to count your breath or do something like that, a slightly concentrated practice, for the first five, ten minutes of sitting, okay, that's a technique. But that's not what sitting is. Sitting isn't about a technique. Sitting is about being that which we always are, which is awareness, pure awareness. And that's all it is. There's nothing else. Awareness of what? Awareness of everything. Awareness of the external environment, what we call the internal environment, or our body, which includes the breath, but the breath isn't more important than anything else. That's just awareness. When thoughts come up, they're just little energy fields that are blipping around. And there's nothing wrong with them, because they're what are happening. The only thing we get into trouble there is if we identify with them and make them into something special. And we all do that without exception. There's no one who doesn't get caught in his or her thoughts. So there's nothing that we're doing except maintaining awareness. Now that uh, sounds simple, and actually we can do it usually for about 10 seconds. It's extremely difficult. For one thing, it doesn't interest us. Um, see, I don't know how many people, uh, new people come here. And invariably, when they're told what sitting is, they come in. 
you know, Joko, I think this is boring. <laughs> and it is boring from the usual point of view. It's extremely boring to just sit here. And that's what sitting is. Just to sit. And since all the senses are open, what do we do? If you don't shut them up, if you shut your ears, you won't hear, but they're open, so you'll hear whatever there is to hear. You'll feel in your body whatever there is to feel. And the nose is used less, but if it gets close to lunchtime, uh, we smell whatever's cooking, and then, of course, we add thoughts onto that, which need, need to be noticed. There's nothing in sitting except maintaining awareness. Now, our ability to do that is what grows over time. You can call that progress if you want, but basically we're just returning to what we've always been. There's really nothing special about it. So any idea that there's something special about sitting, that we have to get in some spiritual state or some wonderful state or some state of special clarity or depth, that's not it. Now, as you're sitting, if you really maintain awareness, uh, which you probably won't, but if you do, it feels so different from what we ordinarily do, we may think we've done something special. But not really. And I want to emphasize, since there are many people here doing different things, that sitting is not about shutting out your thoughts. It's about seeing them as thoughts of no importance whatsoever. But I don't know of anyone in here that doesn't think his or her thoughts are of some importance, including me sometimes. We definitely don't see our thoughts as just being empty energy little blips that just, for whatever reason, are set off. We take them seriously. When we take them seriously, we create emotion, false emotion. If we don't understand all that, our life is ruled by false emotion. Uh, we don't get around to living at all. You know, your husband says, well, you ask him to do something. I don't feel like doing that. I want to watch the football game. It doesn't take much. Off we go. Well. This marriage is supposed to be about 50-50. And here he is, selfish. He's going to watch the football game. See, that's and we're gone. It takes about that much. How long do we stay gone, folks? Sometimes, if you've been practicing a long time, 10 seconds. <coughs> Sometimes two days. In the meantime, the atmosphere stays what? Cool all because we haven't seen a thought as a thought producing an emotion. Now, if you're married, I'm not saying never to talk things over. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm talking about the false emotion that poisons life. And without exception, we all do it. The thing that practice is about is separating thought from bodily sensation. Now, classic Zen often does it by suppressing the thought, so you're just left with bodily sensation. It doesn't work very well. If we haven't seen through our thoughts, the minute we're off the cushion, they come popping back just as strong as ever. That's why, from my point of view, a concentration practice leads to mischief. I haven't seen it yet lead to anything else. Now, concentration can be used, as I said, at the beginning of a period. If you're just all over the place, <coughs> it will settle you down. But it's not a practice. It's a device. It's a technique. And real practice is not a device or a technique. It's about simply sitting there. Now, as I said, we don't want to simply sit there. Because, see, we're, as long as we're human, we're always looking for something. We're waiting for something. 
What are we waiting for? Anybody? We're waiting for the time which will be what? Perfect. Perfect. What else? What other adjectives could we use? Peaceful. Peaceful. Okay. What else? Better. Better. Okay. <laughs> what else? Different. Hmm? Different. Yes. Different. Okay. What else? Pleasurable. Pleasurable. Yes. What else? Happy. And then, sort of coming out of all those, we're waiting for the time when I have some importance in the world. I really get somewhere. I'm not saying anything wrong with getting somewhere. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm talking about what we're doing in our life. So when we're given the instruction to simply sit there, well, that goes over for about 20 seconds, and then we begin. Because the human drive is to get somewhere and to fix up this life that's obviously not quite right. If we can sit with what is, which is simply just sitting here for 20 or 30 seconds, that's a long time for almost anybody. See, people say, but I'm here for enlightenment, okay? When you can sit with what is for five, six, seven, eight hours, uninterrupted, your question will vanish. So don't bring me that question. What I'm interested in is what goes on with you so that you're always looking for something as opposed to just sitting here. If we're not looking, we're waiting for something. It's the same thing. Waiting for what? this wonderful light that doesn't seem to have shown up yet. You know, Joko, if I could just have that man, it would be all right, or that woman, whatever. Then I know, then my practice would be all right. But see, I'm so upset, waiting for something. Or I'm so lonely, waiting for what? waiting for the time when, for some reason, you're not going to be lonely. Waiting for, what else do we wait for? Security. When I have enough money, then my practice can begin. When I have enough anything, enough kids. <laughs> some people just go on producing children. I mean, it's interesting. Nothing wrong with that in itself. It'd be great to have 10 kids, but not if you're doing it because you're waiting for something. And we all are waiting for something, waiting for the time when life will be fair. Forget it. <laughs> it's never going to be fair. Life isn't fair. Everyone looks very miserable. <laughs> <laughs> See, look at what you're waiting for. What are you personally waiting for? Mm -hmm. What are you waiting for? To be found. Huh? To be found. To be found. Okay. Who's going to find you? <laughs> okay. We all have our own little twist to this thing. Such a miserable job when I when I retire. Okay. Then when you retire, what are you waiting for? <laughs> That's a more complicated one. Okay. All right. Waiting, 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 waiting for something. See when I get established in my profession. When I get tenure, then it's all going to begin. When I lose 10 pounds, it's all going to begin. Waiting, waiting, waiting. And it's because we're doing that that we have a great aversion to just sitting here. I can't waste my time like that. Let's see, I have to think. And off we go. We view. See, we view just sitting here as being what? That's a waste of time. See? I'm not accomplishing anything. <coughs> now, please don't misinterpret what I'm saying, is that I'm against accomplishing things. That's not the point. OK? 
if you truly accomplish anything, you're just doing right here, doing right here, doing right here. You're waiting for nothing, you're just doing. But what I'm talking about goes deep into the cells of a person. It's our very nature to push towards something else. We aren't quite sure what sometimes, but we do know we need it. Something's missing. We have to go after it. And you don't sit for long at all before you meet it. So the whole problem in the sitting process is right in there. And that means that those thoughts that we want to entertain so fervently have to be really looked at. Not changed, there's nothing wrong with them, but not worshipped. See, people think they worship the Buddha or the Dharma, some word or other. Nonsense. What we worship is our little minds. Mm -hmm. That's what we're interested in. I want to be enlightened. Being enlightened is, you can get glimpses of it, little cracks sometimes appear. They're not terribly important. A true enlightenment is when, in a way, that's over. This whole process I've been talking about is over. We're just willing to just be, at least a good part of the time. Uh, it's not so easy. And every difficulty in Sashin is so valuable because when things are difficult is when we have to look. There's no way out. We have to look if it's hard. Particularly if we're in pain, it's pretty hard to wander off. We just have to be here. So some pain in session is necessary, but I don't want torture. That's a different matter. Pain is valuable. Torture is not. And remember, everything I'm saying is simply a change in the way we see our living. And when we do, even a little bit, even a little bit is earth shaking. Our whole life starts to unscramble. And with many of you, I see it happening quite strongly, in fact. It's really amazing to see that confusion and upset. It isn't that it isn't there, but it's, it's got a different color to it now changing. Somebody, I think it was the Dalai Lama, said, you know, there's only one thing that all this practice comes down to. Kindness. It's not some big, big thing. Kindness. See, we can't be kind to the world if we're endlessly trying to manipulate it so we can get somewhere. We have no interest in the world. Our whole interest is in that frantic drive to be somewhere else. Okay, now my problem today isn't Dharma talks, it's getting teaching time. So I want to open it up now for questions about the sitting process itself. Now I think some of you think you know all about it, but I doubt it, frankly. See, sometimes people come in and they say, oh, I really know now that I'm angry. That's not it either. It's the ability to separate the angry thoughts from the body sensation, which is what practice is. Just knowing you're angry may be better than not knowing it, but that's, that's not it. Maybe step one, but we're interested in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay? Just knowing you're angry and, heaven forbid, expressing it to other people is not it. That's the last thing we should do under the name of communication is to express our anger to somebody. Anyway, questions, anybody? Think for a moment. I know you're all exhausted. I can tell by looking around. But stir your minds a little bit and see if this is clear. 
because we're talking about that which transforms your life if you understand it. You know, you can sit for 20 years. If you don't understand this, it's of not much use to you. So. Why in the world would just, would just noticing what you're feeling just affect other, you know, there's more, there's more in one's life than just what we're feeling and what this is. Mm-hmm. Well, definitely there is, but what's the blockage to doing effective work? Well, some of the things we think about aren't things that we would be able to change. I mean, Give me I'm a angry and, and I know that I'm angry and I sit with that and eventually it passes and uh, that affects the realm of decision for me. Mm-hmm. But there are other things that sitting allegedly helps and so such as my health. Uh, I didn't say that. It may, and by and large, over years, it uh, may help your health. But uh, this is in, a in, yeah. In terms, no. not, not necessarily physical health, but mm. your mental and emotional health. Is that in, what you're talking so, about? So, how do I get tranquil just by? Uh, Did I say that the point of sitting was to get tranquil? No. No. Well, you didn't say it was the point. No, it's not the point. But you did say that things start to unscramble. Yes, but only if you're willing to be the lack of tranquility. See. see, so often people come in and say, well, I can't sit right now. I'm too confused. I'm too upset. <coughs> see, <coughs> the sensation then is what? If you're confused or upset, what's the sensation? Whatever it is, it's some sort of tension for you. And there's certainly some sort of thoughts going on. Now, it's the separation of those and finally settling into the sensations, which unscrambles. But from your point of view, it's a willingness to do what? Sit. Sit with what? Unpleasantness, usually, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I said, the last thing a human being wants to do is to stay with anything for more than one second that's unpleasant. We don't like it. And what's more, as Americans, we don't even think we have to do that. (laughs) Our whole culture is based on what? Making it easy, making it pleasant. Uh Even taking an ice cube out of the refrigerator these days is too much. It's all supposed to come plunking out for you. It's utterly ridiculous. But anyway, let's go back to your question, Mark. Um, See, the whole point is whatever is in your life is it at that second. You see what I mean? And that's to be, understand what it means to be that, which means to separate the thoughts out and just be that. See, we don't want to do either one of those when it comes right down to it. Is what has to be done. That's extremely difficult. One, we don't like to look at our thoughts. No, no, no. What do we want to do with our thoughts? want to play with them, you know? Oh. Yeah, I was talking to somebody in the Bay Area the other day who likes to be depressed, and I said, and one thing, at the last moment I said, and one thing you should never do, by the way, is complain. Well, you would have thought the world had come to an end. Okay. Not complain? but I have to share with my friends, don't I, what's going on with me? I thought, well, they'll thank you if you don't, but anyway. (laughs) (laughs) But aside from that, see, complaining is just more thinking, only you're thinking now and putting it out. More thinking. Um, So the first thing is a willingness to look at that thinking. We don't want to do that. And even less do we want to stay with a sensation that we call, what? Unpleasant. So both sides of sitting are very low on our list. And so we sit session. During session we learn. Uh-huh. I don't know if that answers your question, Mark, but think about it a little bit. Yes? So would you amplify a little bit for pain and torture? I didn't say torture. <laughs> uh, there is room in the other house in the dining area for anyone who's having severe pain to go if you want. There you can sit with a little bit more freedom to move. I'm not talking about wiggling, I'm talking about moving. You can sit in odd postures if you want. We're not into torture here. 
but moderate pain is definitely a part of session because you know when you're in pain you can't wander off into this dream world that we like so much um, if something hurts I suppose my knee really hurts here I can try to think and daydream but it's hard see if something hurts it keeps us here so moderate pain is a very nice thing in session. In fact, if it weren't there, it should be there. But I don't want anyone <coughs> getting hurt. <coughs> I don't want anyone doing something foolish. So, And if your pain is at the excruciating level, remember we have different kinds of bodies. Some people sit easily and some people don't, you know what I mean. So if you're having a lot of trouble, uh, speak to the monitor and just say you're going to go sit over there for a little bit. Yes, ma'am. So, Colonel, would you classify taking a deep breath as wiggling? Because sometimes if, if there's a lot going on, if I take a deep breath... No, it's that's not wiggling. No. I, mean, you know. no. I mean, you have to breathe, and whether it's shallow or deep, you know, but I'm don't do it audibly. Fine. Yeah, but I mean, quietly, but it's... Right, that's, that's you know, fine. You have to readjust your body. No, that's thing. fine. That's fine. Mm -hmm. See, the characteristic of wiggling is it's not aware. It's almost like trying to think about something. But a deep breath is in the realm of awareness. Yes. Um, that's what I would like to think about this idea of separating the thought and the bodily sensation. Uh -huh. um, uh, let me propose the idea that for me, uh, let's say it's a, a, a let's go with anger. Uh huh. And with, with anger comes a uh, uh, kind of a, a maybe a nauseous feeling in the stomach. Mm -hmm. um, without the anger, I wouldn't have that feeling. Without the thought, you wouldn't have that Without feeling. Without the thought, uh -huh. right. the feeling mm -hmm. would come. Right. Is one thing that occurs to me. So I don't know about the separation. Like if I throw one out, the other goes with it. It seems like. Yeah, and you can start with your body. You don't always have to start with the thought. But you should be aware of anything that's showing up, okay? And if you're very angry, some people find it's most effective just to s really stay with that contraction. Uh, but very few people can do that long before what comes up? The thought that goes with it. Right. So you have to be aware of both of them, okay? And what I mean by separating them is simply awareness that this is my thought. I really hate her. My body sensation is, depends on what you do, but we all contract somewhere, okay? And it's the awareness of the two which breaks that emotion down. And eventually, if you can stay with the bodily part of it, it will dissipate until you have another thought, of course. <laughs> this is a practice you have to do 10,000 times. It's, that's putting it mildly, okay? Staying with the bodily part means not denying that that tension is happening there, just feeling it. Just feeling being it, there. being that sensation, see? See, if I pinch your arm and say, be it, what does that mean? It means to feel it, yeah, yeah right. right. And this bodily contraction, that's all I'm saying. Just feel it, you see. Now that sounds simple, but it's not so simple for human beings. All I can do in a Dharma talk is attempt to make some of this clear, or clearer, let's put it that way. Um, it also sounds like a long time. It's a long time because the drive to think is so deeply embedded, see. Uh, what really wears out is the belief in those angry thoughts or disturbed thoughts. If you label them a hundred thousand times, after a while they just collapse of their own... I mean, you get bored with them, you know? How many people here have had the experience of having getting bored with your own uh, thought process? Yeah, right. Particularly when you, one reason session is effective is you sit there and you see the same old stuff, you know? Um, when you see it eight, ten hours a day, something's happened to you. It will never be the same again. Um, see, the most important thing about session is that you sit a long time. Now, if you don't sit with awareness, it's not going to help you a lot, but if you sit with any amount of awareness, which could be even 30, 40 percent is high, you are changing rather rapidly as a person. Okay? Sue? Huh? I mean, if you're not moving, that's, um, I can do a whole lot of moving and squirming and swallowing and dry lips. 
I swallow once in a while, but notice that that's your particular thing, maybe. Mm -hmm. It's not quite like a runny nose, just let it run, but with saliva, I would swallow it once in a while, okay? <laughs> uh, but be aware. See, the important thing with all this is to be aware of what you're doing. When you say 30 to 40 percent awareness, and that's good, mm -hmm. do you mean like that's high. A, a high, right? Mm -hmm. Do you mean moment that 30 or 40 percent of us is aware, and or do you mean... No, I mean that at that moment, for instance, I can sit down for a second, I really feel here, but if you were to take, if you could, it's really hard to know, but if you took, say, three or four sitting periods and could kind of tell the no number of minutes that you weren't lost in your own thinking. So phasing in and out of the consciousness. Mm -hmm. And everyone does it. It's not a sin. But it's just the awareness of that process which is uh, valuable. Yeah. Ellen. Strong, uh, a little louder. Strong contractions make movement in the body. Is that like if they're If they're involuntary, that's okay, yeah. Doing this uh, is okay, yeah. That's all right. That's not uh, wiggling. Is kind of like I'm pretending to be here, but <laughs> I'm wiggling, trying to cover over something. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite often, not usually the first day, but third, fourth day, you'll see a lot of involuntary movement. That's okay. And monitors, by the way, need to know the difference. Mm -hmm. If you don't know, then think about that. Okay, anybody else? I haven't really looked down here. Any questions down here? See, understanding this is why you're here. If you don't understand your sitting, see, it's very possible to sit through a session and you kind of get into kind of a deep trance-like state that feels wonderful. It's absolutely useless. And if you don't understand the sitting process, you can sit for years and be fooling yourself. I meet it all the time. I'm sorry to say that. See, the mark of good sitting is that your life will transform. And if that's not happening, which means you become more tolerant towards yourself, towards other people. You don't get angry as quickly, and if you do get angry, it doesn't last for as long a period, uh, you can more readily see the point of view of someone else, not just be completely locked over here. Um, your work becomes more effective. You're willing to do work that is at times unpleasant. You're just willing to get the job done. There's just a slow but steady transformation of a person's life. And that's hard. Okay. Any last question? If not, we'll finish. Anybody? And if there's anything I've talked about that's not clear to you, please come in. Sometimes it takes two years for some of these things to get really clear. Sometimes people can say it, but it's still not really clear. So it takes a long time, and that's what we're here to do. So don't mind asking questions and bringing up the same thing over and over and over. That's just fine. Yes? You can still attach to my angry thought. Uh, well, you and everybody else, but anyway, <laughs> yeah. If I'm angry at, say, my partner for something that has happened, uh -huh. and I sit and I separate my thoughts from the bodily effects. Uh -huh. um, and there still is, it should be a resolution with my partner on this I topic. Didn't, I didn't say anything about that. Anybody want to answer that? Just that maybe just that not having a resolution becomes a little more all right. That's part of it, but sometimes there's a definite question that does need to be settled. So, uh, Diane. Well, you know, what I, what I do is, is um, when possible, to just try and get in touch with that body sensation. And sometimes, you know, you, do, you don't get in touch with it, and there is something that has to be resolved, and you do the best you can. But as much as possible, you try and get in touch with that. And, and acting from a place then is, is just is, is 
less attached to actors in anger. Yeah, see, the point is you want to do an action in the world always that benefits not just you, but your partner. You see what I mean? When we come from a place of anger, that's very difficult. When we're really angry with somebody, all we want to do is punish them. At least we want to be right and have them say, oh, you're right. <laughs> doesn't happen very often. But anyway, if the anger itself reaches a different place, it's, it's hard to describe it because it's non-dual, then you know better what action to take. And it doesn't mean not to take action. Sometimes you won't feel an action is required, but sometimes it definitely is. But the action you take will be different. And that's in the long run, which is the development of a relationship, is more actions being taken which are beneficial to both parties. That's what builds a good relationship. Um, and it's probably the hardest practice there is. <coughs> That's why I'm so interested in people not staying out of relationships, but being in them. We can hardly avoid it, but some people say, well, I'm just going to sit for the next year. I'm not going to get into relationships. So I think that's a mistake. Uh -huh. That's hiding. I'm not saying to jump into any relationship, but uh, there's no, nobody that is a mirror for us, let's say our partner, our parents, our child. Uh, see, they'll tell it like it is, and most people won't as much. So it's... Uh, anyway, we'll talk more about that when you come in. Okay, anybody else? Or we'll just, uh, Mark, yes. To go back to the example or about, say, your husband that won't do the chores. Uh -huh. I didn't say not to talk about that. Thing. Yeah, but why couldn't you be angry as well? So, I mean, if, if it's a situation in which... Uh, Don't worry, you will be. I didn't say yeah. it. Not a question whether you will or won't. Yeah, I'm not saying that you're saying that uh -huh. you didn't say that there's anything wrong with the anger in some sense either, but why not say, why not respond to this while you're angry? You know? uh -huh. What do you mean? You know, this, mar this marriage is a partnership. <laughs> it is supposed to be 50-50, and this is the, you know, the only thing that's different right, around here is the number of football games you've watched. Uh -huh. so. I didn't say that not to have a very strong discussion. See, I didn't say that. What's the difference between a strong discussion and an angry discussion, though? Uh -huh. You don't love me anymore. You're always a shit. <laughs> yeah, you know, you never do anything for me. It's always this way. See, when we get angry, everything gets pulled up on that chain. Um, but anyone... You know, I'm not married. Anybody want to answer that? Who's younger and doing this? Well, angry reaction tends to just be get more angry reaction. Yeah, when you There's give out anger to somebody, what are you going to get back? Loving kindness? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're human. If somebody attacks me, unless I've been practicing a long time, what do I do? You react. You throw anger back. Then it gets stronger. And the, the amount of stuff being thrown after a while gets escalates and uh, but if you're calm and reasonable all the time then people won't really know that you have feelings so oh I didn't say that I said it could be very strong and I think some people have met in Dyson a very strong uh, disagreement but disagreement like that is not anger See, I think people quite definitely know what I'm driving at you think about that I've never seen anger produce anything but uh, more anger uh, first, Nan. Yeah. It just really seems. I mean, I, my husband and I have married ten years. It seems like we bicker all the time. But it's all you have to do for me anyway at this point. If I step out of it, even for a little bit, and and that anger just sort of it just sort of dissipates somewhat, then the appropriate action becomes obvious. Yeah. Whatever it is. I mean, it might be the weaving forever. Whatever it is. But it just becomes. Uh -huh. And then right. the, it's not pushed by anger anymore. It's just whatever it is, and you do that. Whatever. It is. Yeah. Right. Diane, did you have your hand up? Well, I, I think there's a difference in, in kind of re reacting strongly, like, ah, shit. Yeah. You know, that's, that's angry, or don't do that. Yeah. You, know, you might do it a child, for uh -huh. like a child might be getting in trouble or something like uh, that. Well, that's not but, anger, really. But, that's, just a but you can even, it can be like a, a, a quick thing. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that we don't react and that we always walk mm -hmm. around and so. No, I'm not saying that. You yeah. can even say, damn it. I'm not saying that. I'm not talking about some never-never land of just like this. But there's a big difference in a relationship that is not just anger being batted back and forth. Uh, I don't know. I know a lot of 
course, obviously, a lot about everyone's relationships here. And until people learn not to keep throwing that anger back and forth, uh, usually the relationships are not that good. And I find that when they've learned some of this, it's not that it's peace forever, forget it. <laughs> That's not it. But what it really is, is more of a recognition that this reaction is mine. Uh, it's not all about what you've done, you see. Um, and it's, that's a different world. Um, okay, anybody else? I, I think we should stop around. Again, later than I thought. Okay, let's finish. And, you know, this is the sort of thing, aside from straightening out your sitting, is what Dyson is for. Um, the idea of oneness in the world is ridiculous if you're angry all the time. I mean, that's just something in the book thing. Well, anyway, I could keep explaining this, and it doesn't do any good. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's finish for now, and then we'll go ahead.